1972, Los Angeles City Planning Director Calvin Hamilton released a 75-page report that explained how to implement a population ceiling in Los Angeles. The secret, Hamilton said, was down zoning, in particular, placing strict limits on the small apartment buildings, such as fourplexes, bungalow courts, and dingbats that had long defined the city's many low-rise neighborhoods. Takeaway apartments and the city's population growth would slow. And I, I, I'm gonna probably interject on this one a little more Please. than usual, even Joe. But yeah, wow, at that first, I mean, I wanna post this thing and just put it everywhere. I want everybody right. to know about this. Because when we're looking for housing for people, we specifically, it's so easy as a realtor because we get around to so many different areas, can mm. easily identify, oh, that neighborhood doesn't have any multi-units, any, right. <laughs> you know? Right. And then you go into other neighborhoods and like, oh, that's all huge apartment buildings. So there was a little balance here with some up zoning. And my guess is that areas they considered maybe lesser desirable will up zone those. You can build big apartments, but everywhere else we're gonna down zone. And that's what happened. And you can see the distribution of that throughout our city. It's just amazing. Yeah. So, so planned and structured to end up that way. Yeah. Okay, so the effort was remarkably successful. If it had been built to the absolute limits of the zoning code in 1970, Los Angeles could have held apartments for 10 million people. By 2010, the city's zoning envelope had been tightened to limit its hypothetical capacity to 4.3 million people. Wow meaning that if every single residential lot were instantly transformed into its highest intensity use, LA could barely house more people than it already contained. Yeah, and I think I looked up our population just the other day, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're around 3.9 <laughs> million. Right, right there. And our housing is limited. And now people are leaving the city because they can't afford rent, they can't afford housing, and it's, you know, it's even effective today. It is no longer kosher for city officials to talk about population control. On the contrary, as a recent tourism campaign attests, the zeitgeist in Los Angeles is very much that everyone is welcome. The region has poured billions of dollars into a subway network to try to decouple population growth from traffic congestion. The state has forced the city to allow accessory dwelling units, also known as garage apartments or granny flats, in neighborhoods once limited to single family homes. And, and still, I, oh, go ahead. I'm still commenting. I can't stop commenting on this article. Jeff. It's good. It's a really good article. <laughs> it's a really good article. So what? It's dense. Look at that sentence. The state forced the city. If the mm. state had not forced the city, we would not have ADUs. We would we would not have built as many new houses as we, as we have already. That says a lot right there. All right, still housing growth in Los Angeles has been anemic. The city builds fewer new homes per capita than almost any American city. That is the chief reason it has become by some measures, the country's least affordable place to live. Duh. All right, success. Mm -hmm. What's missing? the low-rise multifamily housing that the city banned in the 1970s and 80s, which is why Christopher Hawthorne, the city's chief design officer, held a competition, low-rise housing ideas for Los Angeles, to solicit new blueprints for so-called missing middle housing. There's a narrative in LA, as in many cities, that neighborhoods are changing too fast, but in reality, LA is changing less rapidly than at any point in its history, Hawthorne told me a former architecture critic at the Los Angeles Times, and for this magazine, he plans to use these designs to win hearts and minds in the community forums where upzoning goes to die. <laughs> Love that line, man. That's a great line. <laughs> really good. All right. Anything there? No. no All good. right. Uh, the winning entrants announced on Monday are a reminder that multifamily housing does not need to look much different than single family housing. Instead, these models weave apartments right into the neighborhood with understated architecture and clever use of space. In theory, these modest plans ought to take the neighborhood character argument against housing growth off the table. 
Then again, the whole dialectic of NIMBY versus YIMBY, Hawthorne contends, doesn't accurately describe the situation on the ground. When we actually talk to communities and neighborhoods, we find most people are in the middle. A lot of recent scholarship has clarified historic issues, such as single family zoning's legacy of racial exclusion. Pandemic and wildfire have clarified others. Most people are ready to say our approach of land use and zoning in low rise neighborhoods is not a sustainable pattern for the 21st century. They just need help visualizing what change looks like. All right, positive. Anything there? Um, you know, I just, it, they characterize the, uh, the, the look and feel of the neighborhoods. You know, there's obviously two components. That's one, the second component that is just overall density because more mm. people will come in and it's unavoidable. It's necessary. Then again, the whole, oh, hold on. There are four categories in this competition. The redistribution design by a team from the United Kingdom explores carving up the landmark Schindler House. The winning subdivision submission by a group of LA-based architects rethinks the city's back alleys as the type of narrow, quiet residential streets you might see in Japan or the Netherlands or Boston or Philadelphia. All right, let's see some of this here. We'll go look at it later. Um, my favorites are the designs for the fourplex and corners categories, each of which pushes beyond what's currently permitted in most of Los Angeles, answering the low-rise challenge with clusters of little buildings on each lot. The fourplex design by the LA-based Om Givening and Studio MLA flips uh, traditional domestic architecture on its head putting bedrooms on the, on the ground floor and public space on the second floor, ensuring light-filled living spaces on a crowded parcel. The Corners winner by Brooklyn-based architect Von Weissenberger uh, proposes adaptable units in a flexible pattern that reserves existing trees, preserves. Those buildings enclosed a central courtyard for residents in the style of an old bungalow court. They also contain street facing, ground floor commercial, or community space, which has long been banned from mostly residential blocks in Los Angeles. It's a funny twist on a contest for speculative architecture, a forum usually characterized by bombastic designs that are gunning more for social media shares than for a building permit. Wow, yeah, nice. so true, <laughs> so true. Uh, these renderings are muted almost to a fault. Bright colors never hurt anyone. Then again, consider the brief. Entrants were asked to watch hours of video in which LA residents talked about what they wanted and did not want to see in their neighborhoods. If the result is something you might walk by without a second thought, that's the point. The client is world's most exacting, the American homeowner next door. The Low Rise LA is Hawthorne's second city sponsored design competition. The first, which selected a group of pre-approved designs for ADUs, had a more explicit connection to streamlining growth. Most of the low rise winners would require various changes to city law to be allowed in the most places such as uh, relaxed parking requirements, smaller lot sizes, and mixed use zoning. In short, they're illegal. <laughs> so far, Los Angeles politicians have not shown much interest in the missing middle program. Maybe these designs can build support for local policy changes, but the more likely venue for uh, housing reforms is in Sacramento, which has abolished some of California City's uh, rules that limit housing choice, like those banning accessory dwelling units, and is taking aim at others, including uh, parking requirements and apartment bans. When the Los Angeles City Council took a ceremonial vote on State Senator Scott Weiner's proposal to uh, permit small multifamily buildings near transit statewide, overriding local zoning, 
members were unanimously opposed. They would never say they want population control, but they support the policies that were created to achieve it. Hawthorne thinks great design is the spoonful of sugar that helps the infill density medicine go down. He believes that architecture uh, reached through careful community outreach and founded on consensus will able to break through the single family zoning paradigm. From this per perspective, the constant kvetching over how new buildings looks is not pure nimbyism, but a cry for something better. Now, something better is here, and that theory will be put to the test. All right. Wow. Wow, I love it, first off. Um, so <laughs> the, the battle that I've been involved in, and as you know, Joe, I've been very involved yeah. in local politics and activism for a long time, and I felt I had to walk away from a good portion of it because um, I, I felt somewhere along the direction this is going, I was in many conversations yeah. with developers bringing plans and it was like, it's just big, it's just ugly, let's find something that integrates into the community that fits with the terrain that works with the hillsides because a lot of the areas we serve are hillsides, you know? And, and I believed in that and I still believe in that. So this, this yeah. helps support that. But then in the end, you know, after working through all of that for so many years, yeah. um, it came down to that they really just didn't want more density, period, right. no matter what. So my- No matter liberal, no matter conservative, well, no, no, the conservative yeah. wanted density. The conservative was more, okay, build, it's a business, okay? And, right. and I, I definitely lean towards liberal, but I also feel that we need more housing. And I felt that for a long time. And I just, I grew tired of the resistance to mm. some more density. And so here we are. We are, our prices are crazy. Our prices are high, our rents are high. And what is the city of LA doing? They're basically saying to landlords, okay, you subsidize existing buildings, you landlords subsidize rent for everyone, okay? Right. And they're still not allowing more housing to be built and the prices keep rising so people are forced to leave our city. So they're not doing anything. And all these people who want, who, who cry more affordable housing, more affordable rents, but they're anti-development, even intelligent, integrated development. That's not right. right. You can't have it both ways. Well, you know, something that's been brewing in my head is, so you talk about conservative, pro-business, all that. That really hasn't been answered here because what are we seeing in places like Glendale, uh, places like uh, say South Echo Park, huge uh, Hollywood, huge high rises, uh, just ugly, ugly, ugly. You know, it's it's addressing the density issue, which is great. Those guys are making money, business, all that's good. Now, what's going to happen here? What's going to be their incentive to do the middle? And, and the middle what's is being be? left out. By the way, uh, 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 Kui is asking to post it in the uh, comment section. Oh, post yeah, the article. Take a look. Um, all right. So, oh, yeah. Hi, guys. And then can you post the link of the article here? Yeah, yeah. I'll grab it. Cool. So they're doing the same thing. And, and it, the article really captures that, the nimbyism of it, in that they're saying, okay, over there, you can build really dense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you drive through neighborhoods, the, the area that comes to mind specifically is, is like the San Fernando Valley. You drive down the street and they have 100 unit apartment buildings lining all of their major streets. You get off the main street and it's single family homes. There's nothing off the main street. So, but then you try to figure out what you're going to do in the neighborhoods that we're in that are older neighborhoods that have a combination mm -hmm. of single family and some small multi units. There just has to be an opportunity to add to it. And if you just keep saying no, then like the state did, they have to force it down your throat to basically allow, force ADUs, force them to be more affordable. But they're still finding ways that the city that just blows my mind to make it less efficient and more costly 
to build. <laughs> and they, look, I, I am pro owner, pro affordability, and I, I don't want it just to be all money grab for all these big developers, but the, the city makes it more costly and more lengthy. And really their policies are not doing anything to help both the residents or the developers make it a better city for all of us to live in. Well, and that's the thing. Are there going to be tax incentive uh, incentives for these developers, subsidies, something? I'm, I'm excited about these designs. I'm excited about the middle here. But again, between the, na the neighbors, the nimbyism and the developers in a city that's not really there at the forefront. Right. Yeah. I mean, you talk about and, and I think I've seen one, maybe two recently. Um, you, in the 60s and 50s, you used to get a lot of, you know, six to 12 unit apartment buildings being built. That's what they're mm -hmm. talking about here. Some integration of increased density. And again, I have a I'm very empathetic about this. Um, but if, if you don't want to live in a dense city, don't continue to to shed everything from happening and the growth from happening um, mm. because it's going to happen. Maybe you just need to move to a lesser dense area then. I mean, we're at the city center of a major metropolitan area. Continuing to resist increased density, you know, seems unrealistic. Yep. Well, let's take a look at some of these. Uh, going to get rid of us and uh, Let's see here. So this is the corners category. First place, Von Weissenberger from Brooklyn. Of course, not Los Angeles. But uh, yeah, look at that. Gosh, man. Open spaces. Sure. Kumbaya. <sighs> bio roofs, dogs, cats, old people. It's great. That's some expensive space, though, in this city, isn't it? All those. Yeah, but what do they do tables. is they adjust your, they, they allow you to push the setbacks further out. They allow you yeah. to put, put more units on the land that you couldn't do before. So it's balanced out. I mean, th this is the great thing about getting people involved in this process that are excited, that are engaged, that are professionals yeah. and have studied, you know, yeah. and, and have seen it. Look, the reality is we've had so much resistance in LA for so long. It doesn't surprise me a bit that somebody from Brooklyn, uh, forget <laughs> that, go go international. Look at people in massive metropolitan cities that have been around for hundreds of years. Yeah. I'm sure they could come up with lots of great ideas that we could do in our so, city. So, you know, this, this picture in particular really shows how this can meld into any residential setting, any single family neighborhood. Look at that. Yeah, that's fine. I can live with that. That's great. And Kuei was asking about ADUs. They certainly are. I mean, ADUs are a, a statewide ordinance at this point in all uh, city entities and, and building and safety departments are supposed to follow minimum guidelines established by the state on, on, on time and on trying to limit costs so that they can be built uh, faster. So almost every home can be at least two units or three units these days. That has helped. But there are still limitations to work within and it hasn't it hasn't quite been enough yet. So I, I think, you know, getting one more unit here and there helps. But if you're to replace a single family home with six or eight units, that's really going to exponentially grow. Our, our population is we're already short on supply and our population is growing faster, substantially faster than what we're building. So here is second and third. Uh, guys, I put the link in there for you if you want to check these out in more depth. But uh, beautiful and practical. All those good things. Um, let's see, fourplex category, first place. You know, Darren, this is reminding me of uh, some potential clients, at least one, of that co-op group that co-living group that yeah. we met and how to make sense of things now. Uh, this could be years away, but you, uh, you know, what would be amazing to accommodate this approach would be, would be financing, like get some yeah. creative who wants to engage maybe traditional banks 
aren't as flexible mm -hmm. but like that group who was talking about a co-op and you talk about construction financing and the amount of money you have to have uh, and look the majority of your average citizens aren't going out and building spaces but if there were other options for financing and maybe yeah. ar architects to assist them and build out their spaces and see the opportunities that exist maybe more people like that would get involved and create yeah. the own little community or sell them off you know tic's stuff along those lines are, are becoming more creative and that that's yeah. A separate element of financing that then made created an opportunity for more people to become homeowners because of the TIC yeah. financing and that could happen I would like to see that happen from a, yep. a builder perspective rather than it having to be big builders with lots of money maybe that whittles down a little yeah. bit more affordable to people to help them build out their spaces and create more housing that way yeah I think the point you're making, at least how I'm taking it in right now is, yeah, uh, there are a lot of middles here. There are a lot of hybrids that need to happen uh, between investment, financing, developers. Uh, yeah, we got to find that level. It's not just one. For group. sure. I just, yeah. I'm always inspired to, to find things in the middle that work for a broader group of people. So much energy sure. these days, so much energy is put to the top and the bottom and uh you know the middle just keeps getting left out and i think yep. there's a lot in the middle that we can all benefit from all right let's see subdivision yeah it all looks great all right. <laughs> so this is the alley idea uh european japan uh, totally i mean look i talk about future retirement i loved being in the uh one of the, the best times I can think of, man, just sitting around in a plaza, you know, mm -hmm. in, in these big old cities. That, oh, yeah. You know, was that Mexico these, when you were? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. I, I could just go sit there every day and have lunch, have coffee. Yeah. You know, yeah. you get to meet people. Yeah. There are resources available there to you. And it's just relaxing. It's so nice. Well, you know, just looking at this and what you just said, you know, the Nordic countries certainly have this more together. Uh, not just development, but co-living, multi-generational, yeah. older people helping younger people, vice versa, sharing the load. I don't know. Maybe the U.S. is just too big for this sort of thing. <laughs> well, you do take. You have to take a larger area. Like even the plaza approach to to living, um, you had to integrate the commercial and the residential. But then you you cut down on traffic. You didn't need cars, yeah. so yep. you could get more structures in there. Um, you know, a lot of people that leave the U.S. go to um, international cities are, are looking for that because it really doesn't exist here. Yeah. You know, why not bring some of it here? Yep. All right. Well, we're pumped up. That's awesome. Baby, go. thanks for the questions. Thanks for watching us. And uh, yeah, anybody else, please ask questions. Uh, we'd love to jump on that and, and get some answers or at least some opinions <laughs> at the least.